um, and very much will prefer to hear what your uh, stakeholder leadership and development challenges are and use those to share my my tips and, and my perspective. So what we'd have to do is really uh, maybe uh, either a volunteer who's willing to share her or his uh, challenge, main stakeholder or development challenge uh, with us to get the process started. So you can share your question by just unmuting yourself or uh, type it into the chat if you prefer. Uh, somebody's writing on my on my screen share. Okay, just to break a silence. Uh, hi, I'm Paul. Um, one question concerning stakeholder management as a um, product owner for me is um, how, how do you incorporate stakeholder management leading stakeholders into the um, scrum mechanics? Like um, in, in which events, um, yeah, are you doing what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, great question. Thank to, you to, for asking to, it. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. So how does Scrum help us as product people or generally how does Scrum, what mechanisms does Scrum offer to um, manage, engage with, lead the stakeholders? Um, before I answer your question, I hope that's okay. I'd just like to briefly share my perspective on um, the, the groups of people a product owner or a Scrum product owner should interact with. And then I'll uh, try and uh, answer your question as good as I can. So Scrum product owners um, should interact, uh, at least that's my perspective, with users and customers um, and understand who those individuals are, have the opportunity to meet them. So the rule of thumb that I like to share is uh, meet users and customers at least once a quarter, at least once every three months, at least selected individuals to understand their perspective and needs and be able to empathize with them in addition to looking at all the data on a regular basis, uh, all the user interaction data, the usage data that's coming in, hopefully. And then we have the, the stakeholders. So um, when I talk about stakeholders, what I mean are the, the, the internal stakeholders from the various departments and business units. For commercial product, that could be somebody from marketing, a marketeer, a sales rep, maybe somebody from service or support, maybe a finance person, um, maybe there's another department or business unit involved. Um, and then we have uh, one or more development teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, Scrum product owner, again, should interact with all three groups, understand their perspectives and needs, and um, leverage the, the expertise, the knowledge, the creativity of the stakeholders and development teams in order to progress the product and create value for the users in the business. Um, so that's my perspective and to a certain extent, maybe, maybe uh, theory. Now, how does Scrum help, uh, help with um, managing stakeholders? So I think the, uh, a number of um, the key, the, there are a number of ways how you can use Scrum in order to engage and work with your stakeholders. The key um, mechanism for me is the sprint review meeting. So the sprint review meeting uh, encourages us to inspect and adapt the product, uh, look at the latest product increments and gather feedback from uh, users, customers and internal stakeholders. Now, if you um, validate the, that you've met, that you're meeting, doing a good job at meeting the user and customer needs in different ways, for instance, by releasing uh, the product increment, then often the sprint review meeting has more an internal focus. It's more about updating the stakeholders and um, benefiting from their perspective, their ideas, their concerns, um, and, um, and using that in order to make the right product decisions and validate that the product is, for instance, serviceable or sellable, or that the marketing person um, knows about the progress and um, is possibly adapting the marketing strategy accordingly or um, providing and creating the necessary marketing collateral. That's really the, the key mechanism in a good way to um, visualize and understand the, the progress being made is not only to demo the product increment. So part of that is a, a demo. So I find demos particularly for internal stakeholders or business stakeholders very valuable. But the other mechanism, scrum mechanism that I find really helpful is to work with a release burndown chart. 
and uh, put the um, progress made in the current sprint into context and see how we're trending. Are we on track? Are we off track? Are we able to um, meet the desired outcome of um, a release or the next two to three months uh, on time and on budget? And if not, what can be done? So that, that creates transparency. Yeah. And again, allows us to collect feedback, uh, hear the concerns and ideas from the stakeholders. The interesting thing um, for me is that Scrum changes the stakeholder management approach. So really Scrum, uh, that's at least how I understand it, encourages us to move from stakeholder management to stakeholder collaboration. But it also in a way says to the stakeholders, don't expect that you'll get a formal uh, status report or update. Uh, don't expect that there's a steering committee meeting or something along those lines. No, 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 no. If you're interested and if you can contribute, that's wonderful. That's brilliant. In fact, you expect it to show up. You expect it to be at the review meeting and offer constructive feedback and offer your perspective. So instead of pushing out reports to the stakeholders that either get ignored or escalated, well, that's my take on it, of course, and it's biased. <laughs> Scrum says, let's invite the stakeholders. Let's bring them into the process. Uh, let's, uh, let's meet uh, and get together at the sprint review meeting. And then hear those concerns, hear those ideas, hear those perspectives, and discuss them. Um, of course, it should be the product owner who has the final say. So, you know, one of the issues generally with collaboration and collaborative decision making is that there's a mistake to either choose the opinion and perspective of the most senior person in the room, the most powerful individual, or to uh, try and agree on a, on a, on a vague compromise and, and broker some sort of a deal. And neither is usually uh, a recipe for success. So what product owners should do is listen to what the stakeholders have to say, understand where they're coming from, what are their underlying needs and concerns and interests, um, but then decide in a second step what pieces of feedback to take on and how to action them, um, or maybe not to action them. So I think that was a rather long answer. Was it helpful? Indeed, thank you for that. My pleasure. Thank you for asking. I think Andreas had a question. Oh, come on. <laughs> Okay, have you ever heard about Fifty Shades of No? Fifty Shades of No? Well, no, uh, yeah. No? <laughs> <laughs> 51, yeah. Is, is yeah, the yeah about... I'm not wondering. Just 50, yeah, just 50. Uh, it's something I learned in, in the Netherlands. So there was a similar meetup about product owners and how to prioritize and how to deal with uh, the lovely stakeholders and all the things coming out with, okay, they wrote a book about it in Dutch. And the, uh, the book is called Vijftig Tinten van Nee. Uh, so this is about Fifty Shades of No. It's a very nice thing, uh, and I can uh, propose it to you. It's nice if you, if you read Dutch and understand Dutch, uh, otherwise not, uh, where you can, uh, where they summarized about the different uh, kinds of product owners, you know, from, from writers about proxies into mini CEOs and, and, and how to transport them. And what I see on slide six is uh, also kind of how to sort uh, the, the, the stakeholders and how to deal with them. So probably it's a similar approach what you're going to talk about, it, maybe. But uh, I, I just like the idea of calling it Fifty Shades of No. Thank you for that. So my question to you, uh, um Roman, is that the only way we can engage stakeholders in Scrum? So when you look at the Scrum framework, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you all know uh, Scrum and you'll, I'm sure you're all aware that Scrum is intentionally simple. And it's, it's really, the way I understand it, a framework that allows teams to um, create uh, products, particularly digital products. So that's the main focus of Scrum. So generally, Scrum doesn't offer that many mechanisms, techniques, that many practices, that much support for product people. Um, so from a product management perspective, it's rather incomplete, but intentionally so. You know, it really wants to be a, a, a simple framework. Um, what is helpful for uh, anybody who works as a product person, 
So I think what's really helpful to be aware of and be in mind is that as uh, certainly product people, we shouldn't engage only in a product development. And again, I see Scrum very much as a product development framework, but uh, we should also engage in discovery. So, you know, product discovery is a term that uh, I first encountered in the context of stage gate processes which is like a very waterfall sequential based innovation process, but it's been in recent years used um, in an agile context by people like Teresa Torres um, and uh, Marty Kagan to indicate a, a modern form of product discovery where we try and do some um, 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 customer discovery and, 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 and market validation where we try and figure out is there a need for a product? Um, who are the customers and users? What would make the product stand out? Um, how can we monetize the product in one way or another? Um, is there any idea about how people might want to interact with the product or any rough ideas um, which type of technologies or architectures we could use? So it's really looking at the market and understanding user needs, understanding trends, understanding the competition. And that's what's meant by discovery here. And so um, one way to look at discovery is to uh, look at uh, brand new products or bigger product updates. Say so you want to extend the life cycle of your product and take it to a new market, new market segment, maybe add brand new features or change existing ones. Then often it's a good idea to have um, some upfront time boxed discovery and then followed that by product development. And just in a way to position Scrum, this is where uh, Scrum comes in, in my mind. Yeah? So of course you can use some of the Scrum techniques in order to um, facilitate, in order to structure, manage the product discovery work. But for me personally, that wouldn't be my first choice. I'd rather use a more flexible approach, a Kanban-based process to do that. I personally find Scrum a little bit too, in a way, uh, restrictive for that. Um, and then here we have a product that we can ship. And so, uh, uh, so maybe I should say, uh, this is about um, what is also referred to in a, a customer um, um, development or a lean uh, startup context as problem validation. So does a, a problem exist? Uh, is the problem significant enough for a large enough group of people so that it's worthwhile uh, addressing it? So problem validation, and then we move uh, to product development and to solution validation. Um, and so this is really about uh, the needs, and this is about the, the users, this is about uh, what makes your product stand out, um, the differentiators of your product, and about uh, monetization, business goals, and business model. At least, uh, that's my perspective. And then product development is really about the right user experience, the right uh, technologies, uh, and, and the right functionality. So there's a, there's a shift. I've intentionally drawn those two circles as overlapping. Now, what I would in, uh, encourage is I would encourage uh, a, um, an understanding where the product owner really manages the whole innovation process from evaluating an idea and validating an idea to then um, having it shipped in form of a finished product. So I should say the Scrum product owner. So for me, the Scrum product owner is also responsible for discovery. And a great way to generally carry out product discovery work is to embrace a collaborative mindset and invite at least the key stakeholders and development team rep representatives to um, formulate something like, um, you know, um, hypotheses about who the customers and users are and what needs the product should address or what the main problem is, the primary benefit is that the product should uh, address or offer and, uh, um, and test out those assumptions together. The benefit of that is that you uh, leverage the expertise and knowledge of those individuals that for a commercial product you make sure that you take into account technical feasibility issues right from the beginning or you you take into account sellability and issues right from the beginning or you, you, you sort of discover early on that maybe the sales channels uh, don't exist or aren't um, uh, uh, effective in order then to offer the new product and sell the new product and that's something you have to do that can be very useful 
Um, so benefit from people's um, experience and knowledge, but also make sure there's a shared understanding of uh, who the product is for, why people would want to use it or pay for it, what makes it stand out and how the product is monetized. And by involving people in those key strategic product decisions, you maximize the chances that they support them. Yeah. But again, it doesn't mean that everybody gets her or his say. It doesn't mean that you should follow what the most senior person suggests or that you try and broker a weak compromise. And this is about finding uh, strategic decisions that are sustainable. So you get as much buy-in as possible, but also move you forward, move you in the right direction. And that's then really the job of the product owner to find that balance. Yeah. And so for me, uh, it's very helpful and important to involve stakeholders early and frequently. Yeah. And it really starts by, again, doing some discovery. Um, if you're familiar with some of the, the templates and tools that I've created over the years, uh, I would suggest that you kick off uh, such a time box discovery uh, piece of work by coming together and cr populating, creating together a product vision board. But you can use any 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 tool, any any template that you find helpful to do that. You can use Ashmoria's Lean Canvas or Alexander Osterwalder's Value Proposition ca Canvas, whatever works for you. The point is that you um, the important point is that you ask the right questions early on, and again that you consider. Um, doing it together with the stakeholders rather than you doing it on your own and then you're in a position where you have to you know maybe maybe sell it sell it to the stakeholders persuade people um to follow your ideas and that can be can be tricky and uh, not very satisfactory and then the second aspect that i'd like to uh, briefly uh, share with you when it comes to discovery i hope that's okay because i realize i'm talking uh, quite a long time again is um um, continuous discovery and the way I like to look at continuous discovery is as, as two workflows and again I find it helpful to involve the stakeholders in the development process by inviting them to the sprint review meetings and in a way expecting that they show up and uh, contribute in a constructive manner if not send in the scrum master go and talk to your scrum master and uh, equally involve oops no uh, thank you sorry about this Siri seems to be very uh proactive these days, at least on, on my machines. Maybe it's just me, a user error, I guess. Um, so the same is true for discovery. I think it's nice to uh, regularly involve the stakeholders in discovery, um, in the discovery workflow. And so what I like to suggest is, and I should maybe write this down. So here, sprint reviews. And depending on your sprint length, those will take place every one to four weeks. And as a rule of thumb, I think it's a good idea to have the stakeholders present at least once per month. So if your stakeholders say, look, every week or every two weeks showing up and spending two hours together, really, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're quite pressed for time here. I'd say like, well, at least once a month would be good, really. Um, and with discovery, what I would suggest is that as a rule of thumb, I would say that uh, as a rule of thumb, you uh, get together and have joint strategy reviews uh, once per quarter, where you uh, look at the product performance, uh, you look at the data that's come in, uh, the KPIs, you look at trends in the marketplace, uh, consumer trends, technology trends, regulatory trends, uh, you look at what the competition is doing and you look at if there are any bigger changes in, you know, with regards to the business, the company, particularly the business strategy. Um, and uh, you then go on and look at the product roadmap and say, is our product roadmap with the uh, goals or the benefits, the outcomes that we've stated still valid or do we need to make any uh, adjustments, any uh, adaptations? And I think, again, it's really helpful to this together to ensure that the stakeholders understand your strategy and roadmap, understand your decisions and support them as much as possible. And that just makes it more likely that those uh, strategic decisions are actually being translated uh, into appropriate actions and, you know, they're, they're being seen through. So, um, um, yeah, stakeholders should be, should be involved in, in, in both, both of those processes. But discovery, uh, maybe just to finish this off, uh, discovery is something that isn't mentioned by Scrum. I mean, Scrum doesn't talk about product discovery, doesn't talk about ideation, doesn't talk about market research, doesn't talk about um, validating assumptions, doesn't talk about product strategy, doesn't talk about product roadmaps, doesn't talk about business model, doesn't talk about business case. But again, that doesn't mean that those plans and the related activities aren't uh, helpful. It just means that Scrum is a very simple framework, very much focused on developing a product and validating ideas about the solution and silently assumes 
that's my understanding that um, the, the problem validation and the, the market research and, and validation of key strategic ideas, that's already been done. That's a good point. And, and now my bloody question of the day, um, how much time do you want to spend in discovery? If you make a balance between discovery and development? Yeah, nice, nice question. Thank you for asking that, Pierre. So with the time box discovery that I've tried to sketch here, how much time you need or you should consider spending on discovery will depend on how innovative is the development effort or how innovative is your product. Um, the more innovation there is, the more uncertainty and risk there is, the more time you're likely to spend in discovery. But it's, of course, a little bit like a question, how long is a piece of string? Um, who, who can tell? Who knows? So whenever we don't know how long, how long something takes, uh, it can be helpful to use time boxing and say like, all right, then let's time box this to two weeks. Let's time box this to four weeks, but let's have weekly meetings where we get together and we see how the discovery, the validation work is progressing. And those are then opportunities to change course. Those are the opportunities to finish it early. If we feel like, hey, we're already done. We've, we've addressed all the key assumptions. We've validated all the key assumptions, brilliant. We're in a position now to uh, build the actual product or to kill the effort. I mean, it can turn out that you're just not making any progress with any of the discovery and validation work and you're just treading water. And then it might be better to say, you know, it looks like this is just going to be too difficult or too unrealistic for us. Maybe we should just cancel the, uh, cancel the development effort or the, the innovation uh, initiative, I should say, right here, right now and move on free up uh, time energy um, of the individuals involved. And with the continuous discovery, my rule of thumb is for uh, the product owner, the Scrum product owner, to spend at least uh, about half a day per week in discovery. So some people like to literally spend half a day. <laughs> uh, or some people like to do a little bit of discovery every day, an hour or so every day. But I think what's important is really to plan it in and block time in your calendar. Um, discovery work, uh, strategy-related work tends to be important work that isn't particularly urgent. And we have a tendency to deprioritize non-urgent non -urgent work. But what it does is it's likely to create more unplanned, urgent work in the future. So if you don't attend to the product performance, you don't attend to what the competition is doing, you don't attend to trends, then you're likely to oversee opportunities and threats. And you may find yourself with your back against the wall in a few months' time, uh, being a little bit desperate trying to catch up or sort out an issue. So it's good to try and be proactive and be able to be responsive rather than being forced to react. But again, uh, as we're busy people, as product owners I tend to be busy people, it's important then to block time and make really time for discovery and see it as part of your, your core work and not something that is nice to have. Well, I'll do it when I get to it and I'll do it when I have some time. So I saw something very weird uh, popping up uh, in, in, in very large projects. I remember one big customer, it was a group of fans. They send people in a discovery session in the US in the Silicon Valley, very pretty. They make with their work with a lot of music, UX designers, service designers, design everything upfront. So they try to have all the scope defined upfront. Mm -hmm. So they spend, let's say, 80% of the whole budget and, and discovery, which was nothing more than the scope management. Mm -hmm. And after they spend very, very little for the development of the solution. Means we want to think upfront everything. Is it not a little bit counterproductive yeah, i think there's uh, it's really about balancing um the discovery work and the development work and i don't think you want to um, spend too much time and effort in uh, with discovery activities uh, at the same token you don't want to rush into development so the um what i what i tend to say is let me see if i can find this very quickly Another challenging point from Sylvia, she said, so taking product discovery into account, a PO is nothing more than the project man product manager? Oh, yes. Yeah. So for me, I very much look at uh, a Scrum product owner as an agile product manager. I've always done it. And uh, I've sort of portrayed the role in that way in my book, Agile Product Management with Scrum. Um, in fact, um, the product owner in Scrum role was originally called um, a product manager. And then Ken Schwaber changed it in a subsequent version of Scrum um, 
to a product owner uh, in order to uh, emphasize the level of ownership uh, product people in Scrum require. Um, and I guess also to a certain extent to get away from the term uh, product manager, uh, product management in the 1990s, for those of you uh, who uh, can remember, was quite different from what we're seeing today, partic particularly uh, with regards to digital products. So product management, the way I, I, I got to know it uh, way back, was very heavyweight, very uh, much following a sequential process, very much like um, doing market research and strategy definition and product roadmap definition and requirements definition, handing it off to a project manager and essentially then just being part of a, um, um, a change control board, a project steering committee, and then coming back to prepare the launch of a commercial product. So there was no real interaction with the development teams. There was no really emergence with regards to features of the product and, and requirements. There was no collaborative effort when it comes to understanding users and customers and their needs and the competition. It was all highly specialized, uh, compartmentalized. You could say people were essentially working in silos and um, documents were essentially um, handed, handed off. So I think that's quite different from the, the idea that we have today. And so, you know, that's how, that's what product managers did back then. And so Ken introduced that, that, that term to indicate the level of empowerment. That's my take on it and yeah, offer, offer a fresh perspective on product management. Unfortunately, that sort of got lost somewhere. Yeah, because um, this is still a big debate. Even Sylvia say, oh, this is very controversial. This was taboo to say that a PO equals a, pro, a, a product manager. I don't know if it's controversial. I mean, you, you just get different perspectives and I think ultimately you have to figure out for you uh, what is right, what works. The important thing to understand is that a product manager is always a product management role and then you get different types of uh, product owners i think that's the maybe the controversial piece uh let me see um, so uh, before i before i go on uh, i thought i'll share this uh structure here i've mentioned it before the product vision board this is not to advertise it to you but it's a wonderful little tool that you can download from my website blah 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 <laughs> so um, i'll I share this with all my 200 teams i work since uh, because it's very good and and I see here I have a, I have Tanas in the row in, in, in the crowd. We work together at SAP and they we we transform this. This is used very useful. Oh, thank you, Pierre. Thank you for the feedback. So the reason that I thought I'd quickly show it to you is that when you have so this, this the what I would call product strategy is described here uh, by the bottom four sections: target group, needs, the product, and business goals. And so I would say you're done with product discovery. So just to quickly go back to product discovery to finish off that conversation, um, or at least answer the question, you're done with product discovery when you have no significant risks left in those four bottom sections or no leap of faith assumptions. As long as you have key risks or leap of faith assumptions left, you're not quite done. So that's a good way, a good heuristic at least to understand, can we move on? Um, or should we spend a little bit more time in discovery? And if we've already spent, say, a month or six weeks in discovery, and we're not really willing to spend more time, but we still have assumptions and risks left, well, what is then the consequence that we should draw with regards to the innovation initiative? Should we still go ahead with the idea, or should we maybe pivot? Should we maybe kill the uh, effort right there, right then? Yeah. You mentioned here something like uh, just enough discovery to start. Yes, just enough and uh, just in time, you could say. Yeah. yeah, I remember your class. You mentioned it. Hey, so uh, yeah, you, you don't want to overdo the discovery, but at the same same token, you don't want to rush into development. Um, and from a Scrum perspective, you could say, if you don't know who the users and customers are, if you don't know why they would want to use the product or uh, why they would why they would want to uh, pay for it in one way or another if you don't know why people would choose your product over a competing one and if you don't know how the product is going to benefit your business that you're not in a position to stock the product backlog because chances are what you will do is speculate you'll just dream up some user stories well not necessarily dream them up but you just think like oh wow yeah what could be right what would be cool and then you possibly end up with a long product backlog possibly even a fairly detailed product backlog uh, that it's going to be hard to prioritize and manage and in the worst case a lot of the ideas just aren't very valid yeah. so make sure you have nailed those key questions who are the customers and users why would they want to use the product 
um, what makes the product stand out and how is the product is the product going to benefit the business now back well, to the and and see you have another point which i guess is very good in time now so taking product discovery into account again she asked also how to handle technical debt and needed migration etc I'll, I'll get back to that if if it's okay yeah. i'll just like to sort of sure. uh, come back to the point uh, product owner product manager is it controversial or not so this is another uh, little diagram that i recently drew up because i i I notice that people continue to be confused about the different types of ownership and the different owner roles that are being used. And I sometimes talk to somebody and after who says she or he is a product owner and after talking to the individual for a little while, I discover actually the person isn't what I would call a scrum product owner. And for me, when I hear product owner, I always think of scrum product owner. It's just my conditioning. So I've got a fairly strong bias there. Um, but the individual may work as a as a feature owner or maybe as a portfolio owner. So, um, and it can be very helpful, I find, for organisations and for individuals alike to reflect on what ownership do I have? Do I really own the product in its entirety? Then I'm a product owner, a Scrum product owner, and I would argue that's pretty similar to a product manager. I mean, Scrum says the product owner is responsible for maximising the value that the product creates maximize the value that the product creates wow okay so i'm responsible for value creation that's very similar to what we would say in a traditional context about the main responsibility of a product manager um, but a feature owner very much owns uh, a product capability a part of the product that users uh, can interact with end users can interact with a component owner would own an architecture building block a platform owner is a scrum product owner but owns a technical product that other products are integrated into or sit on top of and then interesting is the safe product owner because safe as you may well know also uses the product owner uh, term to uh, refer to a key role but unfortunately well i'd say unfortunately that's judgmental but from no no it's it's unfortunately i'm okay with you <laughs> thank you so i'd say unfortunately the product owner role is reinterpreted and let me just quickly show you another little diagram um so what safe does is safe splits the scrum product owner in, in at least two roles i mean maybe even into three so there's a business owner who's got i think overall responsibility for the success of the product and value creation then there's a safe product manager and there's a safe product owner now the safe product owner in is very much a, a tactical product person somebody who takes charge of part of the product backlog or a team backlog and you know helps write the user stories and interact with the development team the safe product manager as far as i understand it takes charge of the strategic aspects of the product and is more outward facing and uh, maybe talks to users and customers and does some competitor research and analysis and uh, you know considers the overall product performance so essentially the responsibilities that are unified in scrum in one person the scrum product owner they're split across at least two individuals in safe and so i think when people hear the term product manager they sometimes think of the safe product manager. And when people hear the term product owner, they sometimes think of the safe product owner, but not the scrum product owner. And so, you know, a safe product owner wouldn't be a product manager. I mean, I'd, I'd fully agree to that. It's just, you know, it's, I'm not saying that it's not an interesting job or not a, cannot be a rewarding or satisfying job to be a safe product manager. So I'm not trying to, um, you know, put the role down in any way, but it's just different. It's different from being a more traditional a product manager in a more traditional sense where I'd have the overall responsibility of an entire product and I'd very much make sure that it addresses the right market and you know creates enough value for the business isn't it a little bit slicing again uh, with uh, back office front office with the back office in charge in, co in, in conversation with uh, the customer and just handing over uh, requirements to somebody below doing more business analysis that really product development so i think that's what what sometimes happens when you have um what i would call component owners people who own different layers so you have somebody who ultimately owns the user interface layer and the user end user interaction and you have somebody who owns say the domain or business layer and somebody who owns the data layer or the persistence layer just to use a very simple yeah. architecture diagram um architecture model here and then the um whoever owns the domain or business business layer really um, 
expect technical requirements. But I think safe is is um, is agnostic as far as I understand the framework. If you work with component or feature teams, you, you, my understanding is you can do both in safe. And so if you have component teams, then the, uh, the the safe product owner would be very much like a component owner here. So yeah, thank you, Pierre, for that. No, I have to be very, 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 very kind to when you speak about safe because I'm completely against. <laughs> because for me, even even the I had also from the from the less which are more positive, and because I know the, the early works uh, of uh, Bass, Water, and and Craig. Uh, I do believe that the feature is nothing more than another kind of product. Then we have more these meta scrum aspects when you have a chief product owner, which just have a bigger product and some have the small part, which is smaller product. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting question, the question of what, what is a product. And uh, for me, a product is a, an asset, a value creating vehicle that um, offers value to a group of users and to the business and largely does it on its own. Yeah. So um, you, you sometimes find that larger features can resemble a product. And if they do, then it can make sense to unbundle, spin off this feature. So I, some of you may still be emotionally scarred, the, the avid Facebook users amongst you from uh, what Facebook did. Was it like five years ago, six years ago? I can't quite remember. It's, it's been a while. Um, Facebook uh, took the Messenger feature um, and... Um, uh, unbundled it from its mobile yep. app and created the Messenger mobile app. And that's allowed uh, Facebook to tap into new markets to all sorts of try out all sorts of new things. And you can do now transfer money with Messenger if you want to. Um, that would have been uh, much more difficult if they'd kept it inside the, the mobile app. Um, so that would be would be an example that, you know, if a, a feature becomes really big, you may want to consider spinning it off, uh, unbundling it. Um, otherwise, uh, personally, I would see a feature as part of a product or pro product capability. And I'd say it may make sense in order to scale up to have a feature owner or possibly even a component owner. That's what I've tried to show here on this picture. Um, and those feature owners will then be responsible for maximizing the value each feature creates, the component owner for maximizing the value the component creates. But then you have the overall Scrum product owner who's responsible for maximizing, well, the product, the, end, the value the entire product creates. And so those individuals have to work fairly closely together. And while the feature owners are more specialized and more focused on parts of the product, they should still participate in the discovery work. And... Um, you know, understand what's happening with strategic decisions, what's happening with the product roadmap and how that how that's affecting their work. And again, share their perspective and, um, you know, their, their, their understanding. Yeah. Oh, we have a question from Abdel. Abdel, can you ask it? Uh, yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I just like uh, this, the, this new model, like that you have for different kinds of product owners. Uh, so how you can handle the conflicting priorities between different pro because I, in my work I, I kind of having a similar situation so somebody is like has priorities at like platform level and then at the feature level we have a different priority there so hmm? how we get and who owns also the business view in this model as well because well, thank you for asking that question. So my intention was not so much to create a new model here, but really just yeah. um, essentially offer a product owner typology in the sense that um, there are different types of uh, owners shown here, visualized. That, that's yeah. all really. Um, now, if you have multiple products and there is competition between those products, then what you would need is uh, what's referred to here as the portfolio owner. Uh, no, I can't okay. really mark this with my Apple Pen, unfortunately. So here mm -hmm. on the left-hand side, we have the portfolio owner. And the job of the portfolio owner is to look after a group of related products. So a classic example would mm -hmm. be Microsoft Office with its core members, uh, Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. Um, mm -hmm. Those products are bundled. They've been um, licensed initially and then uh, you know, subscribed together as a, mm -hmm. as a package, as a bundle. And uh, I, I have no idea, to be honest with you, how Microsoft uh, operates and manages that portfolio. But, you know, if I was in charge, I'd expect um, to have a portfolio owner, an office owner who maximizes the value all those products create together and has uh, responsibility for the overall uh, business model. And then uh, I'd work with individual owners of Office, Word and Excel and so forth. 
and they then have ownership of their products and are responsible for maximizing the value that, that their products offer to the users. Okay, yeah, understand. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to ask a question about this same thing. Uh, what, what happens when, when the product owner is not interviewing the people because, because I don't know, perhaps a platform owner or a portfolio owner is just saying, those are the epics, these are the things that you need to do and then you make it the detail. But without interviewing people, that, that is incorrect in my opinion because, uh, because as it happens in design thinking, this, you understand the customer when, when you start to interview with them. And, and I feel like when, when, when you are a product owner, most of the product owners, they, they, they don't know how to interview. They don't, know, they don't have UX or visual prototyping. They don't have uh, like more complex tools like journey maps or blueprint. They only uh, just have the idea of what to do uh, or, or, or even they don't know how to facilitate big groups because they, they need some innovation, open innovation to see uh, how do you solve that? Because uh, we, you have different roles but but some of them have some part of the of the of the information of the custom and the other are just receiving information from from the third party and that is not agile i think or i don't absolutely. know absolutely no, i fully i fully agree with you and i, I you know i really get, i think i get your point that's why i mentioned earlier that feature and component owners should participate in product discovery work so it shouldn't be that those individuals are just being handed down requirements from the scrum product owner that wouldn't be desirable and be in mind generally that Scrum is a framework that really does encourage collaboration. I mean, if there's one thing that's written all over the Scrum practices, it's working together, collaboration. So um, Scrum wants to do the opposite of compartmentalizing people and siloing people and handing off stuff. Scrum really wants to integrate people and bring people together. You know, that's why Scrum has this idea that stakeholders join the sprint review meeting, that users and customers may join the sprint review meeting, and you benefit from their perspectives and validate the product increment, validate the product decisions that you took. Yeah. Yeah, another point just to uh, experience a, a launch. So I moved away in having just demos in sprint reviews. Because I say demos, I just have my customer coming and say, oh, that's fine. So more like the, the narrow uh, with the thumbs up, thumbs down, which brings no feedback. And with some of my teams, we, we put here, we change this review meeting as a user accepting testing momentum mm -hmm. on a small piece, small chunk of work, but the team has delivered during this the sprint. And so they're testing in front of the computer, having the teams just beside so they understand also much better the, the, the customer or the users. What do you think about this approach? Yeah, you know, I think it sounds nice. The point of the sprint review meeting is not to habitually use a product demo and always run a product demo because that's what the Scrum framework says. Again, Scrum is kept intentionally, has been kept intentionally simple. And the main reason, as far as I can tell, why Scrum suggests a product demo is because it always works, right? You can do a product demo after the first sprint and virtually no, very little functionality has been created. You can still then tell a story about how that piece of functionality would be used and create a scenario. And so that uh, users and that uh, stakeholders can relate to it and offer some initial feedback. And you can do a product demo of a you know, mature product if you'd like to so it tends to always work but it doesn't mean that it's the best uh, technique in order to validate the product decisions that uh, were taken and so i think what you should do is you should really look at what you've intended to achieve with the sprint what is the desired outcome or uh, what is the desired sprint goal and based on what you're trying to achieve say now how can we best test how can we best find out validate that we've met the goal, that the desired outcome has been created. Is it through a product demo? Is it through some form of usability tests? That sounds a little bit to me like what you were uh, describing, Pierre. Or is it through other means? Would it be maybe releasing it to the users and then looking at uh, the analytics data that's coming back or releasing it, but maybe doing some direct observation? What is, what is the right validation technique? And generally, it tends to be a good idea to not rely on one specific technique for an extended period of time, but rather mix and match. 
So I particularly mix and match what's referred to as qualitative and quantitative techniques. So a product demo is a qualitative uh, validation technique. It helps us understand why people would like to um, interact with the product or use the product, why they think, yeah, it looks good, it looks usable. But um, it, you know, it's limited to a fairly small, um, small group of people. And so there's a risk that the people who are giving us feedback, that their perspective, their views, their opinions aren't representative for the whole markets, the whole target group. And so it can be then useful to complement it with uh, quantitative uh, techniques such as releasing uh, software, at least to selected individuals. You can typically select, uh, sorry, release the software to the product increment to more people than you can demo it to, and then see how people actually use it, use it in the real world, use it in the target environment. The drawback with that is that you don't understand why people use it in a specific way or why people don't use it as you anticipated it, why they sort of change the user journey, the anticipated user journey, or why they ignore a feature or excessively use a feature, for instance. So um, the why is difficult to understand, but it mitigates the risk that you're getting feedback that isn't representative for your market. So it's a good idea to mix and match and combine those different, uh, those different uh, validation techniques. And as I said earlier, not to rely on a single one for an extensive period of time. Extended period of time. <laughs> we have, again, Olaf Publitz is putting us back to the main point. Uh, Olaf, can you ask your question? Yeah. Olaf Publitz. Um, how do you convince stakeholders, uh, perhaps the management, to work with uh, these joint meetings, we're all sitting together, uh, figuring out, discovering, uh, instead of putting in some steering committees or something like this. Excellent question. But uh, as I'm focused on uh, product owner topics, it's not really my speciality. That's a scrum master question. <laughs> That's well, a good yeah, that was that was just a, sort of an excuse, really. But I mean, seriously, for those of you who work as product people. Um, Scrum Masters, you, you know, I would, I would hope that you have a qualified Scrum Master who's sufficiently available at your site and who acts as a partner and can support you with issues like this. So, you know, getting buy-in from the stakeholders, getting buy-in from management and raising an awareness why a collaborative approach is helpful. So the amount of collaboration that you're likely to need will depend on the degree of innovation, uncertainty and change that are present. And that's related to the life cycle stage your product is in. Or to put it differently, it's related to how old and mature or young your product is. Okay, So the younger your product is, the more innovation there tends to be, the more change there tends to be, the more you're likely to benefit from a collaborative approach. The more stable, the more mature, the older your product gets the less you need close collaboration because you typically focus on incremental enhancements and bug fixes rather than brand new features. Mm -hmm. So uh, just bear that in mind. So if you currently look after an established product, a mature product, and you hear me saying, oh, you've got to do all this discovery work and you call these people have to work together and you think like, hold on a second, what's he saying? Then I, you know, I, can, I can fully understand. You, know, you probably still want some stakeholder participation but not in, not in that, maybe not, certainly not to the extent that you would need it for a brand new product or when you make um, a lifecycle extension, a bigger change, a significant change to an existing product where you typically need more of that interaction, more of that collaboration. I have a, another very terrible question from Sylvia. But Sylvia, you have to ask this one. Um, so there is this grade of maturity for product owners, but actually it's more a theory than a practice uh, to be at least the mini ceo of a product so how do you have any tips to get product owners on the real ownership don't say use your scrum master <laughs> or no, ask I think, you. no i think it's a it's a, a, a nice question can i write on this now sorry I told you so. The guys are, uh, are just badasses. They love having boring questions. That's why I love them. Oh, that's cool. So when it comes to um, empowerment, product owner empowerment, um, I think there are a number of uh, factors that uh, you know, are helpful to consider. And so the, the, the key challenge, of course, for product owners is that 
as product people, we lack what's referred to as transactional power. Okay, We're not in a position to tell people what to do. We can't make the stakeholders and the development team follow our lead. We can't make people follow our strategy and product roadmap. We, we can't. We can't even, usually at least, offer incentives and you know, offer a bonus, a promise a bonus, or a pay rise. So you know, we can't force people, not saying that we should try and force people, and we can't offer incentives. So we really rely on the supports um, of those individuals. So how do we get their support? Well, one element is um, referred to as referent power. And that's really the power that comes from how we're being perceived as a person. And a key element here is really trust and uh, integrity. And uh, I mean, integrity in the sense of saying what we believe is true and walking our own talk um, um, is a trust building measure. And trust means that I have faith in a person, that I believe that the person certainly doesn't wish to harm me in any way or um, cause me any form of disadvantage, but actually is friendly to me and probably wants to help or support me or you know would support me. So I think that's really key. So you know, one way to increase your, your power and become a more empowered product owner is really to uh, build trust and strengthen the connections you have with the stakeholders and the, the development teams. And you know, think about things like uh, empathy and strengthening your uh, ability, cultivate your ability to, to empathize with people, to reach out with warm heartedness and take a genuine interest in what's happening for those individuals. Uh, practice active listening and uh, admit mistakes. So those are, those are uh, techniques that can help you increase what is referred to as referent power. Um, and then it's kind of hard to follow and trust a product owner who maybe doesn't know quite enough about the product and the market and the competition and the user needs or who struggles to describe the product strategy or draw up a product roadmap. So, um, you know, expertise, your expert power. Oh, I'll try again. So knowledge is power, as they say, but not in the sense, of course, of hiding it, but in the sense of um, really uh, strengthening your expertise. And I quite like to use the, the T-shaped model or the T model, which I think was originally suggested for product people by my uh, colleague, Ellen Gottsteiner. So thank you, Ellen. Um, and the way I interpret it is that the, um, the, the vertical part of the T stands for the product specific knowledge, so market, competition, domain, product category, organization. And then the horizontal part stands for the transferable product management knowledge. So the ability to solve product management challenges in a methodical, systematic way. Again, you know, being able, for instance, to carry out product discovery work and knowing what validation techniques to pick or what um, techniques to pick to validate in product increment, for that matter, or to prioritize a product backlog. Those, were those, those will be um, techniques that uh, relate to the T. And then you can take this a step further, um, something that I like to do and say, like, okay, the, the, the horizontal part, we can break that into two subsets. We can break that into tactical skills into strategic skills and leadership skills. And so it's a simple model to encourage people, help you analyze your current product management knowledge and identify weak points. And product management is a comparatively young discipline. Uh, what's more, it's uh, been changing significantly in the last 10, 15 years. Um, we've also had an influx of uh, new people joining us. It's been very dynamic discipline, very dynamic profession. And it's so rich. There's so much to it. It's multifaceted. Um, and it's very hard to know all product management aspects in depth. It takes many years to acquire the necessary uh, expertise. So it's only natural that we have shortcomings, you know, elements in our product management knowledge bits where uh, maybe the knowledge isn't quite as deep as it could and should be, or where we have little gaps. It happens to all of us. Um, so, uh, you know, by cultivating your expert power, by continuing to educate yourself, by attending sessions like this, hopefully, <laughs> uh, you'll sort of uh, work on your empowerment. And then finally, it's the organizational and management support. So if you work in an industry where traditionally there wasn't any product management, so that's finance, uh, banking, travel and tourism, um, media, 
and uh, publishing companies. Um, what else can I think of? Retail. All those industries traditionally don't recognize product management, certainly not digital product management. And then um, that can mean that the general awareness of what the job of product people and product owners is, is fairly low. And people don't really understand that product people need a certain level of respect and empowerment to be able to do an effective job, do a good job. Um, so it's related to the product management maturity of the organization. It's another way to put it. And then um, it's also related to who your sponsor is. The more important your product is, the higher up the sponsorship should come from. So if it's a strategic product for a strategic in, in, in innovation initiative, then you know often you require sponsorship from the C-level. And that, uh, that, in, that, that sort of helps you with... Um, encouraging the stakeholders to follow your lead. Um, it helps you with, um, it equips you usually with uh, a decent amount of respect. That can be helpful. So referent power, expert power, and management support, those are three things that you can look at. Um, a referent power and expert power is something that is under your control, and management support not. You can only influence it, uh, but you certainly can't change what. Well, Usually, as product people, we can't change management and we can't change the product management maturity single-handedly or the, the company culture. Oh, we try. We try the whole time. I have, I have a couple of very interesting questions. So maybe I keep the same. So we had two times the question how to handle technical debt. But maybe we keep it at the end. But I have a question from Tanya. Tanya, did you want to ask your question? Yes, sure. Thank you. Uh Thank you for giving giving me this chance. So, my question. So, I'm coming from uh, digital products, and um, at the moment there is this question: if you have a bigger prod a product um, on which several teams are working, if the product owner of that team, and of course the team that he or she is working with. Um, should own features and think of the entire journey around those features as part of the product or if you sh if they should focus on product experiences altogether and consider that their product so instead of focusing on specific features maybe they focus on onboarding or motivation or guidance so experiences that you as a user have as part of that product right. So right. I was just interesting where is your stand and maybe what are the the, the positives and negatives for for each approach and when to go for which um, if you have right. that right well thank you for asking that question I think there are lots of interesting uh, elements in there the first one is something that we've already touched upon what is a product and just sort of to visualize what I've already tried to um, explain uh, using words uh, words um, a product is a value creating entity it's something in the context of digital products it's a collection of code plus documentation plus tests so it's, a, it's an asset that creates value for users and customers and the business, the company, and largely does so on its own. So that's a product. A product gives rise to a certain user experience, but the product is not the user experience. And a product owner is not a user experience owner, but a product owner. And as such, I would suggest that the, a product owner in Scrum owns or is responsible for ensuring that the product creates a desired value for the beneficiaries, the users and customers, and for the business. Now, I see somebody else responsible for uh, designing the user uh, experience. And so, you know, if we look at the three roles in Scrum, product person or product owner, Scrum master development team, then we'd like to establish a trustful and respectful close collaboration between those individuals. And I really think the main responsibility and the main leadership focus of the product owner should be to offer strategic guidance using a vision, a product strategy and roadmap. Um, uh, guidance with regards to the product backlog prioritization and stakeholder management or stakeholder engagement. But I often see the mistake that product owners, uh, product people are too tactical and that they in a way solutionize too much. And uh, I th you know, I've met more than one product owner who had the idea that she or he would have to continuously feed a development team with detailed fine-grained user stories. I'm not quite sure where this idea is coming from. Uh, I really think that a development team should not be so much, and this is not meant to be judgmental. I do like classical music and I like pl playing classical music. But when you look at a, at a group of, of classically trained musicians, then typically, and that's why I 
personally come from. So, you know, I'm one of them. Um, so typically we expect music sheets, right? Detailed music scores. It's all written out. So hand it to me and I'll practice it and then I'll play it. I can perform it. But really what you'd like is, and that means there has to be a composer, somebody who writes all that stuff. But really what you'd like to have is a development team that acts more like a, a jazz group or maybe a rock band. You agree on the songs, the pieces that should be performed, the key features, and the, the guys can take it from there. The individuals can take it from there. So you don't have to, at least not for an extended period of time, solutionize and detail everything. So I very much think the design and technology leadership should reside with the development team. And that means doing the UX design. I would expect for an end user facing product that you have UX designers actually working on that development team. Some of you may say, hold on a second, it's called development team. What about why UX designers? Well, that development team was originally called Team in Scrum. And then I think about 2008 or so uh, changed to development team. Reason being that Ken Schwaber wanted to more clearly differentiate between the overall Scrum team and the smaller team. And that Ken has a very wide um, understanding of what development means. So for Ken, development is not programming. Development is any activity that is necessary so a product uh, can emerge, uh, that a product can be created. And that includes design, includes, includes user interface, sorry, user interface, user interaction, and generally user experience design. Uh, development, uh, including architecture and uh, quality assurance and self-organization should be part of the development team. So what I would suggest is that you want to try and mentor and coach your team to a level where the team can take ownership of the solution, the product details. So you don't have to solutionize and prescribe so much. And that frees up your time. It also tends to be a form of empowerment for the development team and tends to motivate development teams. You, you give them greater ownership. But of course, that means that the development team has to have sufficient knowledge about the market, the users and customers, the competition, the product category, right? So I, was, I remember I was once working a few years back with product owners based in the Netherlands. And they complained to me and said they've got some real issues with their development teams and um, they never really implement what the product owners want and can I help? And so, you know, I, 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 we, you know, I, we, we had a workshop and, you know, it turned out that the product owners were all based in the Netherlands. The main customers were based in the Netherlands and Western Europe. All the development teams were based in Romania. None of the developments had been, development teams had been to uh, the Netherlands. And most of the product owners had never met their development team members. The product owners would key their user stories into a JIRA board and then press the button. And then that way the development teams would get it. So there was no collaboration around the user stories. There was no knowledge sharing. There was no knowledge transfer to the development teams to enable them to be more self-sufficient. They were forever dependent on the product owners and the product owners got frustrated because they felt it was such a drag on them, consumed so much time, and still the user stories weren't fully understood, which is natural because as Mike Cohen suggests, a user story is a narrative plus a conversation. So if you only have the narrative and you don't have the conversation, you don't have a user story, right? Or it's a defective user story. It's not a proper one. Um, so I think, you know, really I would encourage you to look into ways, how can I empower my team? How can I coach, mentor my team and um, enable my team to own the solution, the product details, and then have the scrum master who, uh, takes care of uh, process and people issues, including uh, process and method coaching, helps with collaboration and acts as an organizational change agent. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a few shared responsibilities between a uh, product owner and team. Uh, user research, uh, that's my understanding, should be shared. Again, it en enables the development team to acquire first-hand knowledge about the users and customers. And at the same time, you know, assuming you've got user experience designers on the team, uh, you know, those individuals are great partners to uh, carry out that research. And then uh, selecting the sprint goal, agreeing on a sprint goal, and working on the product backlog. Again, that should be a joint responsibility and joint activity. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know if that was helpful, but I'd encourage you to really focus on your core job. Your core job is to offer product leadership and guidance and not to detail every single user story or not to sort out process issues. Um, be, 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 you know, just be, be clear that if you help the team, the team 
it's it's a nice it's nice to care it's nice to help it's you know it's not that I want you not or I don't want to suggest that you don't care that you're not empathic but you know if you care for too long or in the wrong way then the team stays dependent on you or possibly you mask an organizational issue an organizational impediment same is true with the scrum master i know so many product owners who don't have a scrum master or not a qualified scrum master scrum master who's not available adequately and then say oh yeah well what should i do i'll, I'll just cover and it's okay to cover for a few days or a week or maybe a couple of weeks but if you keep covering the scrum master then either work becomes unsustainable and that's unhealthy, or you sacrifice some of your core responsibilities. And some of the work, particularly the important but not so urgent work, that is strategy and discovery work, doesn't get done. And that's not desirable either. So, you know, really focus on your core job. And if there's issues with the development team or Scrum Master, then dis discuss it and try and sort it out, address it in the sprint retrospectives. <clears throat> yes. Thank you for that. W would it be possible just to have a follow up to that, or uh, would you like to share somebody else's question? Oh, follow up, Tanya. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. That was really helpful, and it gave me an idea. It gave me a lot of ideas to follow up. But maybe I also expressed myself wrongly in the initial assessment, uh, in initial question. So for me, where it comes like. Uh, I, I can give you a concrete example. So let's say that uh, I, as a product owner, own feature A, B, and C. And for example, um, I create the vision around these features, and then of course the team implements there. Uh, but one of the things that is that is happening uh, to a lot of the companies is that instead of join, instead of focusing on the on these three features as a team uh, completely, you actually focus more on your strategic pillars of of your product. So let's say, for example, that for your product, the strategic pillars are uh, guiding your users and motivating your users. So the the question for me was more like, from a product management perspective, do you see it more um, efficient on the long term to own a feature from um, beginning to end and set the vision around that, or actually focus on the vision regarding guidance as part of your strategy, and then together with the team, uh, touch all the features in your product that actually um, can bring our goals closer to the the vision of in terms of guidance well That's you know but hmm? well, thank you for asking that uh, follow-up question i think product owner is called product owner because the individual is meant to own the product on behalf of the company so as a product owner you're not a feature owner and again you know the sort of different types of product owners that i illustrated earlier i would argue that you know it can be a very helpful job and meaningful job to own a feature and it can be part of a scaling scaling up and looking after a bigger product but um, I think there's a difference and um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, note is when it comes to vision and product strategy and product roadmap I mean you know those artifacts those plans are called product product vision product strategy product roadmap so again they should really apply to the entire product to create a vision for feature a b and c for me that doesn't make sense and for me uh, a vision really let's see if i can find the picture real quick here oh, what a shame there isn't all right so for me a vision really describes the uh, purpose of a product the reason for being you know why is it worthwhile to provide the product what positive change should it bring about so an example i like to use is if i wanted to offer an app that helps people understand better what they eat, when they eat, and maybe how much they eat, then those will be features. Those will be features of a specific product idea, an app. But the vision you know, should transcend that product and those features. It should transcend the product idea. The vision could be help people eat healthily or you know, short healthy eating. And then the other thing that I would suggest is, you know, that's sort of what the product vision board that I showed you earlier wants to encourage is that you think about how do we get closer to that vision? Uh, what's our path? What's our strategy to bring about that vision? I mean, the vision is a big, audacious, uh, inspirational goal. So what's your strategy to um, realize that positive change, bring it about, to bring about that positive change? And that strategy will be built on who are the beneficiaries, the users? Are there any customers? Who are they? What value does the product create for them? What problem does it solve? What benefit does it offer? What makes the product stand out? And what, what value does it create for your business? 
And then I like to take the next step and translate that uh, high level product vision into a more uh, specific product roadmap. Oh, I know now where the picture is. Let me try another thing because I'm, I realize I can draw, draw this all up or try and find it here quickly. Yeah, it should be in here. There you go. That was exactly the picture I was looking for. So I ignore the strategic process bit. Uh, that's not relevant. But that's sort of the model that I've suggested in my book, Strategize. And that's the model that I like to use and that I, I generally teach. You know? So you've got this high-level vision. Then you've got a product strategy that says, what's your success for making the product successful? You've got a product roadmap that says, then how will you implement the strategy? And the way the product roadmap and the product strategy um, are connected is that the product strategy essentially offers overarching higher level goals, user goals, customer goals, and business goals, so that you can look at the needs as goal statements. And then I take those goals and I break them down into more specific goals, into more specific benefits or outcomes that are typically then tied to two months or three months timeframes. And that's essentially a product roadmap. Um, and then the product roadmap provides the umbrella for the product backlog. But again, product backlog, product roadmap, product strategy, product vision, they really refer to a product, not to a subset of a product, not to a component, not to a feature. So important really to um, have a clear understanding what is, what is a product. And am I responsible for a product or am I responsible for a feature? If I'm responsible for a feature, I'd contribute to the product strategy and to the product roadmap, but I wouldn't necessarily own it the product owner, the overall Scrum product owner would own it. Here you have an, another very good question, sorry. Um, <clears throat> a question from Kleber, then the next one will be for Joelia. Kleber. Kleber Daukuna. Hello. Hello, <laughs> bon dia. Hello, bon dia. Thanks a lot for letting me ask this question. When, uh, the question is, do you think that product owners should be accountable for business compliance uh, and how PO interacts with legal, regulatory, compliance areas? Should they bring them to this discovery sessions? How, how can we uh, get them involved in the product development, product uh, maintenance and product success? Right. Thank you. Well, thank you for asking that question. Uh, while you were finishing off the question, I was thinking, oh, uh, I can show another diagram, but I can't. <laughs> uh, I can't find it quickly, so I'll, I'll leave it for now. Um, so I, I think as the product owner, you're responsible for generally stakeholder engagement, stakeholder collaboration or management. So it's a good idea to think about who are the stakeholders and particularly who are the key stakeholders, who are the individuals whose support you need whose knowledge and expertise you need in order to progress your product and create the desired value. Who are those individuals? And so if a business compliance is a success factor for your product, then I would encourage you to include an individual from that department or that team and uh, invite the person to participate in strategy reviews and in uh, sprint review meetings. So that will be your responsibility. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not and, and equally, you know, I would, exp I would hope that, you know, as you own your products, you have, um, an understanding of what is required to achieve product success and that compliance, for instance, is a major issue. So for instance, you know, I guess, um, I would have to clarify what exactly you mean by business compliance, but so I, I, I used to work, uh, for a number of years with healthcare companies or, and on healthcare products and, um, certification and uh, compliance with um, regulatory requirements like uh, FDA is a major, major success factor for healthcare products. Um, you know, often it's the prerequisite that you can sell it in a specific market. And so in, that, in, in, in those circumstances, having an expert from the uh, appropriate department uh, work with you, at least, uh, you know, part-time, um, I think is, is extremely helpful. And I'd say that, yes, as a product owner, it's your responsibility to recognize, oh, that's a key success factor and, you know, um, and try and encourage someone from, from that team, from that business uh, group to, or business units to uh, come and work with you. Yeah, very well. 
Oh, that's challenging. That's a challenging question, a bloody question. I give you now another bloody question. I love the very terrific. So uh, we had the same question from um, two colleagues here. So Zilke, it's time to your question. Uh, yeah, the question is when we were talking before about the product vision. Um, a lot of times, especially if products are more stable, more mature, there's the issue that a lot of um, technical depths have piled up and also migrations have to be necessary and have to be done um, as systems are outdated, updates are needed and so on. So how should we plan that into our product vision? How can we uh, justify spending time on topics like that, even if they don't create any short-term value. Right, well, thank you for asking that question. Um, so fortunately, I wrote an article not too long ago about uh, addressing technical debt and it, you're doing that in order to ensure product success. So maybe something that some of you may want to refer to. Um, let me see, oh, the picture I was looking for is not in here. That's not useful. <laughs> um, it's still a wonderful article. Uh, let's see, where's the picture? Where's the picture? Otherwise, I'll draw it up here. Here it should be. So um, uh, this is a picture of the product lifecycle, a very useful tool for product owners and generally for product people. I very much like to work with the product lifecycle model. Um, so uh, it distinguishes uh, different stages, development, introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. Those are the traditional names. And then you have launch, uh, you have product market fit. That's the transition, how I understand it from introduction to growth. And at some point in time, your product is uh, going to um, experience an end of life. It's going to die. Uh, that's like a natural death. Of course, there's a pre premature death. Uh, your product may not even make it to launch or your product may not achieve product market fit. Um, now, Technical debt originally was a term suggested uh, by Ward Cunningham. And Ward Cunningham, um, uh, he, uh, he suggested the idea to, to um, very quickly develop what we would call a minimum viable product, an MVP, a good enough product, and launch it and intentionally accumulate uh, technical debt. And then once the, you've validated that the general market response is positive, then to uh, take that product and essentially rewrite it. Now, some of you may say, that's, that's crazy. How can you suggest that? Well, it turns out that often in order to achieve product market fit, you have to make major adjustments to your product, including architecture and technology choices anyway. So, you know, it's, it's, you know it can be, can be a good strategy. But again, you have to then be willing to, to sort out that mess, that technical debt. The bigger issue tends to be what is referred to as unintentional technical debt. So technical debt that um, incurs is incurred by cutting a few corners here and there and maybe you know, not testing or dropping a few tests or not testing as much as it should be done. Test coverage isn't quite as good. Uh, there are some holes, little gaps in the documentation. Over time, that gets worse and worse and worse. Now, as long as your product is changing significantly, and that's really up to and into maturity, technical debt tends to hold you back. Why? It's quite simple because it really reduces the adaptability of your product. So if you want to be able to inspect and adapt and change to uh, quickly re respond to changing market conditions, your intention should be to have low technical debt. But how do you ensure low technical debt? Mm. Well, by applying my scrum, you know, talking about scrum and the scrum mechanisms by uh, applying the definition of done, having a definition of done and only accepting work results at the end of the sprint that are done according to this definition. And definition of done usually means that what you have is shippable or at least potentially shippable. That means executable code that's been thoroughly tested and sufficiently documented. Now, for those of you who don't have a def definition of done, sit down with your development team in the next retrospective and create one. You have to really write down specifically what test it means, what tests are carried out, and if there are any test targets you want to have. I've worked with teams that had some complexity thresholds um, where the, the threshold should not exceed a certain value. And that can be very useful, assuming you have the tools to measure code complexity, for instance. Um, but once your product has hit maturity and once you accept maturity and you then try to maximize the benefits your product creates without necessarily spending much more money on it. So you're trying typically to reduce the spending and you focus on incremental enhancements rather than adding brand new features. Then I wouldn't necessarily suggest that you um, have to be overly concerned about technical debt. As long as, the, as long as you can manage, that's probably okay because 
you know, once you've accepted maturity, you know your product is going to die sooner or later. It's just a question of how long you can keep your product in maturity. Um, so only then do the technical debt work that you have to do. And it's, it's okay at that stage, I'd say, to make some intentional quality compromises because it's unlikely that your product's going to be around for another 10 years. But if you're in introduction or growth and you experience technical debt, then you should really consider stopping and fixing it. So there are different ways how you can do it. You can allocate a budget in every sprint to address it. You can dedicate a whole sprint to fix technical debt. All you can do, and I think I uh, wrote about it in my book, Strategize, you can do what Apple did with Snow Leopard, or with Leopard, I should say. So that was a long time ago. It must have been in the late um, 2000s. Apple released an update from Leopard to Snow Leopard, so OS X. Uh, update and uh, it took them two years two years to get it out so usually they're on an annual uh, release cycle but it took them two years and really for me as an end user I, I still had to pay back then but it didn't make any any difference so what what did they do they ported the operating system to new intel hardware and they um, changed some of the uh, fun internal libraries and they cleaned out the code they did a lot of uh, bigger refactoring work um, and uh, I think that was a wise decision because that enabled Apple then to progress the product and, and grow it in the subsequent years. So sometimes what I'm saying is I'm not suggesting you should take out two years, <laughs> but what I'm suggesting is sometimes taking out a sprint or maybe even a few sprints, like a month or so or two months to clean out the technical debt um, and then you know, invest in future-proving your product. That can be the right thing to do. I mean, to a certain extent, even if you have a development team that uses good practices, good test practices, good coding practices, and does maybe test first and you know, refactoring and continuous uh, um, um, uh, integration and so forth, you know, sometimes bits of that just build up. It's a little bit like you know, your car. Your car needs to um, go and have the MOT done on a regular basis or you need a service and you may have to leave it at the garage you know, for a few days, even though you don't like it. Same is true with a bicycle, right? Um, my bikes need servicing. The more I ride them, the more they need servicing. I don't like it, and I don't like to uh, tinker around with my own bikes and let alone drop them off and have them serviced, but that's just what's, what's required from time to time. So similar thing applies to, to software products. Oh, the, the last point, and nobody, nobody mentioned, and I'm coming just as a, because I have to play with you a little bit, is the commissioning that's the point is never addressed. At what moment in time is the product in charge with decommissioning the product on the old product? So I think the, the two things that help you, one is really <clears throat> um, having clearly defined what value the product should create for the users and the business and tracking that value using the right KPIs. And that way you actually see the curve. So that curve looks different from product to product. Um, that's just the standard curve, standard distribution you see in most of the product management and marketing textbooks. But as you see um, the uh, benefits, the value that your product should provide decline, and you see a sustained decline, you know you've left maturity. And then you have a strategic choice. You can try and get back into maturity, but sometimes that can be a lot of effort. And sometimes it can be better to, to accept that your product is in decline and then look towards retiring your product. What that means will very much depend on the industry you're in. So I, uh, I mentioned uh, um, healthcare. I've also worked uh, for a number of years with telco products and in telco. And some of those products, some of those enterprise products, they um, have service contracts that are being sold with, say, big switches. And so even if a company decides to no longer um, develop a switch, a specific telco product, they may have to maintain it for an X amount of years. Um, so that's, that's important to, uh, to, to be aware of. And then the other factor really is portfolio management. Um, you know, hopefully you have some form of portfolio management established and portfolio part of portfolio management is really to look at how balanced your portfolio is how healthy it is and make sure you have a good mix of younger and older products in there so if you have a product that's that's currently in growth and has the potential to become a cash cow as it moves into maturity you can afford to let one of the mature products slip into decline because you know there's a there's a there's a replacement a substitution in the pipeline not to worry about it if there is no such product and you have to 
um, rely on your product to be a, a cash cow and stay in maturity, well, then of course that's a different question, a different scenario. Yeah, because sometimes uh, I discover something I experienced with with an American company. So you, the team is developing some uh, some work, and they they made releases and every, and all the old releases that have been sold. So you have to have old maintenance contract on the old releases. But at the end, after a couple of time, the technical debt raised up just on maintaining the old releases, and nobody was let's say. Uh, strong enough, keen enough to take the decision, stop uh, supporting all this old stuff. Because this increase, then you discover that your team is doing more support or let's say run than build, developing the new stuff. Yeah. And, and the technical that was an information for the product owner to mm -hmm. stay sharp to take the right decision now. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you for sharing. So I'm getting really quite uh, hot and a little bit worn out here. So I, uh, if it's okay with you, I'll take one more question and then uh, I'll leave it up to you maybe. Yeah, today. sure. You will have a nice question. It's a, it's a nice question from Tanya. No, uh, no, not Tanya, sorry. We already got, it was from Juela. Uh, my question was about the review meetings. Uh, is the development team who does the demo? And secondly, how if you can share some best practice, practices, how a PO can manage a review meeting with a lot of stakeholders who have a lot of questions and feedback. And the third one and the last one was if the PO should drive the conversation with her questions for the stakeholders or should let them free to give their, their feedback in the review meeting. Right, well, thank you for sharing your questions. So again, there's a, a blog post that uh, May, may well address your question in more detail than I can uh, right now. But, um, you know, as it says here on, on, uh, on the screen share, make sure you involve the right people and you invite the right people. Um, so point being, if you want to validate a technical risk, it's usually no point inviting business stakeholders or end users. People might just get frustrated. Um, and then um, do listen to what people have to say and encourage people to share. Uh, so I, a lot of sprint reviews I have seen um, were done rather poorly, where often a developer or tester would show off the functionality that was implemented, sort of half justify or explain what was done. And the users and customers or the users present couldn't really relate to what they were seeing because it wasn't really put into a context. There was no story told. There was no scenario that was provided. So I think it's very important to involve the right people, choose the right validation technique, and then apply it correctly. So when you do a demo, it might be better that the person in charge of the product, the product owner does the demo, and is able to explain the product from a user perspective. So you, you get valuable feedback. So if you have users confused and stakeholders confused by technical jargon and too much detail and then ask people so what you think then they look at each other shrug their shoulders and say like yeah looks good and really what they mean is please let us leave please and they'll run out of the room as soon as they can but that's not that's not helpful that's not valuable i mean you know what what insights have you gained uh, nothing nada so i uh, you, you know, it's encourage people to share, uh, listen to people actively, try and understand if somebody says, yeah, that's great. Why is it great? Why is it good? And what could still be improved? If somebody says, oh, that's rubbish, then, you know, thank the person, be grateful for the feedback. You know, it's some feedback, but ask why, why is it not as good as it could be? And are there any ideas what could be changed or could be improved? Um, and I find it very helpful to have the development team members present throughout the whole meeting. What sometimes works is to split it into two parts, have first an internal meeting, product owner and development team, particularly if you're not very close to your team. So at the moment, I would assume that you work in a distributed fashion or have been working in a distributed fashion. So it might be useful then to have first like um, an internal um, scrum team sprint review where the team demos the product increment to you. Uh, you give your feedback and you say which stories are done and which are not done, which product backlog items you can accept and which ones you can't. And then have a second part where you open up the floor to all the stakeholders and possibly some users. And um, 
and ask uh, them for their feedback and listen to their perspective. Um, and uh, and uh, yes, yeah. Was that helpful? Did I answer your question? Yes, it was really helpful. Thank <laughs> you. I will also have a look to the blog post. Yes. So, yeah. so we, uh, I will share the link to it. Thank you. Okay, I guess it was the last question, Roman. Yes, I think I'm getting a little bit worn out now. But yeah, uh, can, uh, they are challenging these guys, uh, but this is how I like it. So for, for the crowd, I would keep the, the, the link open if you want to have a chit chat afterwards. Uh, for Roman, there's just one thing I want to share with you is this. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Not thank enough. We don't have enough cheering at all. <laughs> it was very good to see you again. So take well and best of luck in your session in Indimbra with so the art. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. It was uh, lovely to interact with you. I hope uh, some of my answers were a little bit helpful. And yeah, all the best. All the best. Take care. And I will share the, everything with you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>